Uh, we're very pleased to have Dr. Adam Vinsale today talking about uh, developing uh, students' criticality. Uh, Adam works at as an academic writing tutor at the Student Engagement Retention Whatever the acronym. Whatever the acronym is, yes. Yeah. Uh, as an academic writing tutor, he's also a UEL teaching fellow. And before joining UEL in 2015, he worked at several other um, universities in English literature departments. And we're very pleased to have you today. So thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, it's lovely to see you all. Good morning. I wonder if we could just go around before we start and just briefly introduce ourselves, perhaps the context we currently work in. I know lots of us have been professional celibacies. I'd, if you are, I'd also like you just to say what your first degree was in, because I think that might be useful for our discussions as we go on. So, should we start here? Yeah, I'm another academic writing tutor. I work in Docklands. Um, working mainly with the engineering and computing students. My first degree was in um, so, uh, social science. And your name? Angela. Hi, Angela. Hi, Angela. I'm Carol. Um, I'm an academic writing tutor as well. My first degree is in early childhood studies. Hi, I'm Janet Malik. I'm also an academic writing tutor. All my degrees are applied. Hey, Tim Penard, uh, Axel, and uh, my first degree was uh, two majors together so it was english language teaching and english literature together okay uh, hi i'm jonathan and uh i'm up in kelp and what what <laughs> english and theater fantastic very close to the Hi, my name is Jamie. I'm an IT project manager by trade. I've embedded in Kelp to help introduce uh, augmented and virtual reality tools into the university. My university degree, my only degree is in French with uh, business management. Fantastic. I am checking out with Kelp and the developer and first degree with Megan Long Kelp. Yeah, and I'm going to have a discussion after the quiz. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'm Robert Nicholson. I'm one of the senior lecturers on the dance program here. Uh, my first degree is in theatre, dance, and performance. Yeah, fantastic. Hello, I'm Pamela Jeffrey, and I'm a, a lecturer in for the apprenticeship uh, chartered managers to apprenticeship. And my first degree is in business management. I'm Katie Nova, another academic writing tutor. My first degree was in modern European studies. Hello, I'm Gans Lignos, and my first, um, I work as an academic skills manager for you, and my viewers in maths. Good morning, everyone. I'm Terence Gregory from the Institute of Contemporary Music Performance, um, a postgraduate programs leader. My first degree was in music performance. Interesting. Good morning, everyone. My name is Christina Bumpley. I'm a learning technology advisor in Delhi, and my first degree was in history and archaeology. Hello, my name is Angela Murphy Thomas, and I am also I'm an academic advisor in Kent. My first degree was animal science. Okay, <laughs> lots of very disciplines in them. This is good. Hi everyone, my name is Kevin Fife, and I'm a technology advisor based in Kell. My first degree was in media studies. Hi, I'm Melissa. I also work in Kelt, and I used to work with Adam and the rest of the video team. Uh, my first degree was in theoretical linguistics. Hi everyone, my name is Seema. I'm an academic developer with Celts as well, and my first degree was in criminology and criminal justice. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, everyone. That's really helpful for our discussions today. I'm particularly interested in kind of different disciplines and critical thinking, and we're going to talk about that. Now, I advertised the session as developing students' critical thinking, predominantly because I wanted to get people in the room. Um, but really, this <laughs> presentation it, it is about developing their critical thinking. But I'm slightly cautious about the term. Okay, so we'll we'll talk about that. And actually, there's probably three titles to this paper because I'm a bit greedy, and I'll talk about them as we go on. Okay, so you'll see here the term I've put up is critical assembly, which I think might be something slightly different. Okay. Good. Okay, so okay. I'd like us to start then just to think about critical thinking. 
And I'd like us just to take a minute or two to briefly on the blank piece of paper in front of you, so the large ones in the middle, can you write down a definition of what you think it is? <laughs> and if you can't, why can't you? And if you can't, why can't you? One of the other titles for this session was Teaching Critical Thinking Without Knowing What It Means. So I hear you, I hear you, and that's part of my reservations with the title. Okay. Can we just take a couple of minutes just to jot down a definition of some folks of what we think it involves? Yeah. Doesn't have to be perfect. I'm sure we're going to revise those. Mm -hmm. As we go along, very difficult for me to put on the spot first thing. If you hold it with a ball cock. Only thinking it, you physically researching. Once you've written down your definition, likely just to turn to the person next to you and discuss and be pairs. Just to compare what you come up with, what's similar, what's different. <laughs> I I'm already seeing some fantastic little notes jot down. It's a very different thing that we've read. It's very that's 
Okay, I just have a couple of complications that I want to now throw out to you. As you do your discussions in pairs of your different definitions, very simple piece. If I was writing the dictionary definition of this, is it a noun? Is it a verb? And what does that adjective? Is it an adjective? Is it an adverb? What does it actually mean? Is it both a noun and a verb? Is it more of a noun than a verb? Is it more of a verb than a noun? Okay. You being critical of thinking of the phrase. Yes, which can it you? Is there a difference between what it is in the phrase and how it's deployed? Yes. Yeah. 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 And that's where the anomaly for students come from. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Absolutely. I've seen some great things. What I want to do now, okay, no. is in front of you, there are small little sheets. Now, these will either have perhaps canonical definitions of critical thinking, more recent ones. In some cases, they also have comments on the state of critical thinking in higher education and within particular disciplines as well. So can you just read through the comment in front of you, Kwai? And think about how the definitions you've been talking about speak to it, contest it. Are they similar to it? Are they slightly different? Do you completely disagree with the code? <laughs> Are they describing something that isn't really critical thinking in your eyes? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, we can have a minute or so, and then maybe we'll go through some of them and just talk about them as a whole, maybe not all of them. <laughs> I don't think he did. Yeah, just a reaction. Oh, it's not the same writer. I don't think it's the same writer. I don't think it's the same writer. Is that plagiarism? Okay. Should we have a look then? So, probably, probably, the term emerges with John Dewey's how we think, probably. But obviously there's a whole mode of critical inquiry that goes all the way back to the Greeks, Socratic questioning, kind of set on full, Antian modes of logic and reasoning. Okay, So okay, there's a whole philosophical history before we begin to get towards this particular term, critical thinking. And I think Dewey's quite interesting for a couple of things. First of all, I have to be honest here, I'm being a little bit disingenuous because although he calls his book How We Think, he mostly talks about what we what he calls reflective thinking. And lots of us in this room, I know some of us teach reflective writing, reflective thinking, but he seems to be using that in a way that we might now think of something that refers to as criticality. There's a couple of things here, okay? Active and persistent, so it requires effort. So maybe it is more of a learn. Careful consideration, but then he goes on and says, and suspended forms of judgment. Who looked at the, either of these? What did you make of that? Do you think critical thinking is suspended forms of judgment? To a certain extent, because we were just discussing about whether you're coming at it from uh, a British educational point of view or a non or, or a non messed up point of view, and so like what are the what are the beliefs that you're already bringing to that question? And so if you're if you're being truly critical to a certain extent, you do need to suspend your judgment in order to critically think about the whole that what the elements. How, how practical is that, though, when we're reading texts? I mean, you know, if, if we had psychologists in the room, yeah, would they say that the suspension of judgment when you read a quote is possible? You know, there's complex arguments in psychology about how exactly that would work. I mean, it might be something we try to do. Who okay, cares, isn't it? And then there's other definitions later on, like the Burns and Sinfield. 
that seem to say it's about constant judgments or continual judgments in a way. I don't really very tricky in this. So that's where Dewey starts. Okay. There's lots here about, you know, careful motorful, which I think is still very useful even today. I think it's about care and attention. And that's one of the things I'm going to talk about in the second part of the lecture. Then along comes Edward Glazer. Now Glazer produces with one of his colleagues the Glazer Watson test, which is one of the main tests that's used to test critical thinking. And he suggests it kind of has a threefold aspect that it's an attitude that comes into all sorts of ideas about our values, our beliefs, our approach. Then he says it's also about our knowledge of logical reasoning and the skills of using those methods. What do we mean? What um, Glazer Watson is used for law mm. um, uh, applicants. To the degree or for jobs? For jobs. Yeah. Now, I was thinking, I found a wonderful quote from Criticality from J.P. Morgan, but I thought I'd best not do it. <laughs> because I, I think this is another question about how it's deployed. I could have put up things in here from university marketing materials and prospectuses. Okay? There's quotes from the OFS about how critical thinking has this incredible life changing. Capacities. I think we'd agree with that. It might improve our options, possibly. But there is an employability agenda as well in terms of how it's deployed. Now, the side. Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. It's, I went here because it's deciding heuristically. Mm -hmm. So when you say, can we just do it? We can't really just do it, yeah. or or can we? And is it the correct way? Yeah. So when you are looking for employment, I think these tests are actually timed as well. So it doesn't really give you the chance to apply it. The Dewey's careful consideration. Right. Critical thinking is slow, right? Yeah. I think we can all. Agree on that, and then you have a timed employability test. Yes, to test it. So I think we need to think about heuristic time. I think we need to think about how it's deployed in different contexts. I said to you earlier, is it a noun, a verb, an adverb, an adjective? I think it's plural. I think I can tell you it's definitely plural. But I think we probably need to say thinkings even though that's uncomfortable. Okay, it doesn't sound right. Okay. What about this? It's reasonable. Its core arguments are reasonable and reflective. Focusing on deciding what we believe to do. So it's just about action. Are they reasonable? Well, based on the fact that you've done your reading around the subject area and you've made your decision based on that reading, reading, reading. So, so in terms of yeah. your your approach, your wider knowledge of the subject, it has to come from that scope. Is there a reason there have been no academic disputes, arguments? <laughs> Wouldn't there? I mean, unless we're looking at reasonable from how the sense of rationale, and yeah. that, so giving some you know, reasons for why and how. So as long as we think about it in terms of rationale rather than beliefs or yeah. attitudes, maybe that works. Okay. You see why when we first started, I'm a little bit uneasy or unsure about the term. Okay? And so I still want to talk to the development students because I think but I think we need to think through I mean, how can we teach something if we don't really know what it is or how we're going to deploy it. Okay. 
is found, which to me seems closer to ideas of kind of philosophy, Richard Paul's a philosopher. So I was thinking, I was thinking about thinking, that mode of thinking where the thinker improves the quality of their thinking. <clears throat> it's kind of metacognitive approaches. Does it always do that? When you're critically thinking, are you always consciously trying to improve the quality of your own thinking? Thing is, Adam, don't you think? I mean, when you speak about that, it's interesting. So, going into a going in today at one o'clock to a session with the um, postgraduate engineers, with two of the lecturers, and they they're looking at the um, uh, mental wealth. Okay. And um, and and under there, under the cognitive, one of the mental wealth is is critical thinking. So yeah. We go. And it's interesting because coming from a social science background, when I go in there, it's kind of like this theory said this, and this theory. You know, you almost you get marks by talking about that. But that's not how they get marks. They get marks from sort of problem solving and doing, you know, is it rational? Is it reasonable to go down that route? And that, of course, has all sorts of implications for assessment design. OK, and I think this is another thing we need to talk about here about, you know, I would say if we think about this. I think this probably tells us that case studies are really helpful problem solving, you know, those kinds of what we would call, I guess, real world scenarios that you have to find. But then I think we'll come to all sorts of other questions that emerge from that if we think about critical thinking, because if we have a legal problem, okay, or we have a problem in nursing, okay, this patient needs palliative care. How do you do that ethically? And you know, here's a case study that looks at, you know, fraud. Are they the same types of critical thinking? It's tricky, isn't it? I, I'm a bit cautious of it as this overarching now. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, already talked about Burns and Sinfield. So, in contrast to Dewey, Dewey says suspended judgment, they say, the art of making clear reason judgments. They don't talk about suspension. Slightly different. But this one really interests me, and this isn't a definition. So this is from a um, professor in home nursing, and he's slightly cautious about how the word critical thinking is deployed in nursing. And how essentially kind of says it's become a bit of a buzzword, right? Become denuded of meaning. Okay. So accrediting bodies, employers, the OFS says, you know, these are this is what we need to be developing. Okay. And we put lots of emphasis on critical thinking and this proliferation of texts. And the question here, and I'm not quite sure whether I'm happy with all of this, it's about pseudo critical thinking. And I don't know how useful that is, because I think you get into value judgments. My critical thinking is more useful than your critical thinking. Okay, my approach is more than yours. But I think there is something here about the way this word is just deployed. I think we need to problematize it. I think we need to think it through before we can talk about how we frame change. I would like to point out to pick up one word in sure. there. Reflect. Now, yeah. they they discuss in nursing, okay, reflective practice sure. more so than a critical thinking. Yes. So, what well, I'm not sure how this hangs. In this context, yeah. So, I mean, so yes, there's lots of. I mean, Janae and I teach lots of skills classes for nursing students, and so there's lots of emphasis on case studies and reflective practice and so on and so forth. But there still is an emphasis on like um, the approach that you can choose within a nursing context. You know, therapeutic approach, so on and so forth. 
And so, I, I mean, I'm cautious of the language here. I, I, I'm cautious of anything that refers to something as a slavish devotion. The kind of evaluative language. I don't think it's helpful, but I do think there is something here okay, about maybe the term slightly overused. Maybe nurses do need, and I think this is Cody's point, need to talk more about reflection than they do about criticality. But that might be our own biases coming in and saying, well, is it as critical as philosophy, nursing? You know. A couple of final ones. Here's Terry Eagleton, the Marxist critic. Okay? In his view, there is no critical thinking in universities since Thatcher. <laughs> Knowledge has become instrumentalized, market driven, and we need to go back to the good old days when we had reason and logic and critical thought. <laughs> Okay. So, did anyone look at this and what did you make of it? More critically analyzed. We critically analyzed. Like, how did you critically analyze it? Well, it's those, the, the questions that was the huge part of it, the why and the how. I think that's one of the things, as you said, it's almost like a metalinguistic term. Right? I mean, it's, it's, you're calling it critical analysis. When we teach that, you know, students, immediately think is to do criticizing mm -hmm. rather than wow. when we we just teach them a simple sort of questioning of things by using questioning whether like how and why so what right? and if you put it in that context and that's what we've been doing with all these definitions of critical analysis is why 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 has this person said this and, and how they come to this conclusion so it's to do with assumptions as well yeah. So rather than just calling it critical analysis, just questioning things with mind. I want to just kind of flag two things Janine said, because I think they're really important as we go on with our discussions. Students think of critical thinking in this like, you know, everyday term as criticizing, as their opening gamut, shall we say. And then you talked about like a method of Socratic questioning, right? Basically, that we ask a whole series of lots of questions and we'll look at some models that I think are useful to do that in a bit. OK, cool. So Eagleton says it doesn't exist in universities because of, you know, a neoliberal agenda. Universities are not left wing enough anymore. Then we have the former universities minister, Michelle Dolan. And she says critical thinking is suppressed on campus. Okay. So there's not enough free speech and debate, and we're all being whittled down by wokery. Okay. Then she ends with this, speaks to the employability agenda. Who would you rather employ, an inquisitive, critical, open-minded graduate or a self-contained cookie cutter? Okay. Who's afraid to be challenged or confront new ideas? So there's also a political rhetoric in Eagleton in how it's deployed by ministers overseeing the whole area of higher education as well. Now, I suspect this probably puts our backs up a little bit. Okay. Well, there's always, it, they hide behind it, don't they, to a certain extent of um, free speech. There's a strong difference between free speech and hate speech and, and um, yeah. So I yeah, have a question where that's coming from. Yeah, I'm going to talk in the second half about the work of the sociologist, French sociologist Bruno Latour. And he's really interesting because, as I've shown, he picks out a few different things. He talks about climate skeptics. Okay? And he says, well, they talk about free speech, but they also do something else. They say, the debate isn't closed, isn't finished anymore. So, you know, global warming, science is still contested, okay? We need to be critical. We need to be skeptical about the UN saying there's 0.5% temperature rise every five years, so on and so forth. Okay? So on one hand, it's appealed to free speech, but on another, the tour says, they're using our critical weapons. 
And I think that is where I want to take things in a second. Okay, cool. Good. So, if we've seen that it's quite tricky to think about what exactly it is, I want to know, first of all, kind of how do you approach it when you teach in your classes? What models do you use? What approaches do you use? What do you do currently? And what do you find helpful? So Janaid said, Socratic question, right? On these, what types of questions? Are you asking me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, how, so what, what if? Okay. Um, and questioning them. So I think there's two parts, there are three parts really. It's analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. It's uh, breaking things apart, bringing things together with synthesis, knowledge, previous knowledge, and then evaluation, putting a value on something. Do we agree? Do we disagree? And then again, why it won't. So it's a couple of things. I'm going to pass around this because I think it's helpful. But just Janaid is, I think, alluding to this model that we use from Lern Pyre uh, of Socratic. And it kind of says well, what you do is you move from description to analysis and evaluation. You don't ask. What my wife yesterday called the journalistic questions, the journalists, the what, when, who, where, right? You ask the why, the how, the what, the, the so what. And if you use this with students, the second page for me is really, really helpful in terms of prompts and questions. So there's one model of Socratic questioning. Now, you talked about also, synthesis, you know, kind of taking things apart, putting them back together again. So if you look at the University of Sheffield's kind of critical thinking page on their skip study skills, then they talk about the LCT model of semantic waves, which kind of follows a paragraph structure. So you say what something is, you unpack it, give some more evidence, and then you repack. And I think that also, it's not a model I'm talking about today. I think it's another one that's very helpful. I think for our students, then put some value to it. Right? So they've got to bring themselves to the table. It's not just yeah. breaking things apart, putting them at their events. Yeah. They have to bring themselves to the table. Yeah. It's the application of it. It's, yeah. I would say, because yeah, when you said it's in three parts, I would say the third one would have been the application of how you are using that, yeah. um, those elements. <laughs> And I guess what we can do is use model text in that one. You know, we could use sample paragraphs, sample sections, and think about how they build their argumentation in that way. Any other approaches that you use? And you must teach it already to some extent, right? Or maybe you find it so difficult, that's why it came to them. For level four, three and four students, it's just the idea of you can question things because many students come in and they think, Well, I'm just a lowly student, how can I analyze what I'm reading that was being published? So, as an approach to for students, is to give them confidence or empower them that actually you can, you can, you can question things that have been published. I, I think, think that's very true of our level seven international students yeah. as well. Um, not just you can, but you must. <laughs> okay. you really need so when you think about the international students, there's a different um, approach, I would say, as well, because it depends on where, where they're from, mm, yeah. whether or not they're allowed yeah. to question. Yeah. Yes. So we need to think about who our students are. If you're the first person in your family to go to university, if you come from a working class background. Perhaps you might find some of the things a little bit more difficult in terms of questioning authority. If you come from particular states, perhaps you also might find those things difficult about questioning authority. It might be if you come from a working class background, you're actually really good at questioning authority. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, you know, none of this is fixed, but I think these are questions that we need to ask. As long as we don't pigeonhole the students, then make an assumption that we 
with a general idea. I think it's it's good to let them know you, you can do this. Um, maybe all students, wherever they come from, whatever background. Um, as long, yeah, as long as we don't assume because you come from this country, you can't do it. Yeah, yeah it's tricky, it isn't? You have to be careful. I usually um, introduce my critical thinking sessions with that kind of opening of you may come from a, a background, whether that's your cultural background or your family background, where this you've been kind of required not to do mm. this. Mm. And, and so get them to start opening themselves up to starting to allow themselves to think critically. Any other models that we use? So we talk about Socratic question, we talked about it's kind of unpacking and repacking. I have to say with that, when I was a student, I used to get feedback that said, you need to unpack your argument. And I used to think, I'm not involved in furniture delivery. Like how, I found that really, un yeah, what's that mean? Because the model wasn't really clearly explained of how it worked. Any other models you use in the past? I think that there's another thing that students say, oh, I've been told by my lecturer I'm not critical enough. So you do, they do get that. You know when they come for the one-to-one -one drop ins mm -hmm. And um, I, I took something from the Alden HE site. It's not particularly relevant for the engineers, but it's good. And it's, in, it's the one that's on there. It's an image of a, of a woman, and it's a famous painting, apparently, you find out later, from the gallery. And then they say, OK, so they've got these stages. Before you can analyse, you have to describe. And then you put the image out to the students. And then you say to them, um, okay, can you describe what's in the image? And none of them describe it. They all put their assumptions on it. Somebody else says she's having a haircut, she's going to a wedding, somebody else says something else. It's really fun. And then you kind of say, and eventually somebody like, it was a woman actually, so she doesn't look very happy. And then they, they suddenly got to the, as a group, it's fascinating. They got to the answer through looking at it. But first we say, can you describe first? And you do have to describe, don't you, before you then make that next jump. But I think we all see things and we bring our ideas and I think that's the point of it. We don't actually see what's in front of us. But I think it's quite good. It's mm. See, that's interesting. Thank you. I mean, here's one thing that we're probably all very familiar with, <laughs> right? With Bloom's taxonomy. I guess one way you could read that resource of, of painting is that they're moving from description up to high order thinking. But it sounds like the discussion emerges more organically, you know. And actually, I'm a little bit cautious about this as well, because when we say describe something, right? Even if you said, uh, you know, a frozen film. Describe um, the impact of the Brexit vote on the UK's current economic situation. Yeah, I don't see how you can do that without critically analysing, okay? Um, you know, and I think sometimes we get wrapped up in these semantics of what's the difference between describe, evaluate, create, and I think the processes sometimes emerge in a slightly more messy way than this. I think it is useful for students to think of going from description to analysis to evaluation. Okay. But again, I think we just have to be slightly cool. Okay, um, just one more thing I'm going to pass around. I think this is the other model that for me is, is really, really helpful. Um, that's one from Newcastle yeah. called the Three Domains of Critical Reading. Okay. And essentially, this really as a resource speaks to these ideas of synthesis. Okay. And it does so in a really, really helpful way. So, we look briefly at the Plymouth model, it moves from description to analysis and evaluation. Has all these wonderful questions. Okay. Why this argument? Why this theory? Why not something else? How does it work in practice? What if they're wrong? How could it be applied? Is it transferable to another field? All extremely useful. I think particularly if you give a case study or if you give a paragraph sample. Then there's the Newcastle model. And it talks about three different domains. So when you read a text, it says, First of all, we think about its validity. We think about it on its own terms. Okay? So very simply, are their aims clearly stated? Are they vague? You know, something like that. 
Okay, so validity on its own terms. Then we move on to synthesis and we think about the relationship between the text and other texts on this topic. And we move towards synthesis. Okay. So one is what is the text saying almost as a self-contained unit on its own? What's the text relationship to other texts within the field? And then finally, it's relevant. How would you apply it? How would you use it? Okay, I see some smiling. Have you seen this before? Yeah? No? No. Is it helpful? Does it look helpful? It's the crown. Yes. 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 Yeah. I think this is really useful. And it also has like a bank blank page on the second page for them to answer. Okay. We take a short couple of minute break just to get coffees and stuff. And then in the second half, I'm going to talk about why we need to stop talking about critical thinking and start talking about critical assembly. And as I do so, I'm going to talk about this new movement called post-critique in the humanities and social sciences. Okay, how about this? Thanks, Thank you. Yeah, I'm so sick of it. I can I can't I can't hear it. I can't hear it. I can't hear it. I can you know, and you know, so let's try it. 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 Just just yeah, it's Absolutely. Because we thought that this this is at eleven thirty. Ah, so you said what's on the page? No, that doesn't seem much. It's my time, I think. Oh, this one is at eleven thirty. Then that starts at eleven. No, so you can so you can the of this and it's an office just to put it. Someone explain what they do. I think it's usually a Yeah. 
So this is this is a model I didn't know of. Queensland um, University Library, I think in Australia. I think it is. Um, the crap test. Yes, I have used it. Currency, relevance, authority, accuracy, purpose. Slightly unfortunate acronym. Memorable. Two A's. Memorable. C R A A P. The crap. The crap. Oh. <laughs> if you're listening to the recording at home and you're familiar with that and you invented the test, I apologize. It's just a slightly creepy Okay. So, what do you What I want to do in the second part is move on and talk about this development that's kind of occurring within the humanities and the social sciences in what's beginning to be known as post critique okay? and part of the movement here is a theoretical one which is saying maybe with movements like deconstructionism post-structuralism post-modernism maybe our questioning of things our radical skepticism has gone a little bit too far. And so there's a little bit of an attempt, particularly in the humanities, to rethink the value of the humanities. And I know we have people from humanities disciplines here who may feel that the higher education environment isn't particularly conducive to the humanities at the minute, possibly. possibly. And I think post critique is a really interesting way both to reaffirm the value of the humanities and the social sciences but what i'm going to suggest is that the models they're proposing are so helpful that i think that they mean we need to rethink critical thinking okay. so i'm going to start with bruno latour a french sociologist and he wrote a journal article why has critique run out of steam in 2003? And Latour is a very contentious figure. Okay? If you're in the sciences and you know his work, you may not be particularly uh, predisposed to it. Okay? So I'll give you some examples. So he did lots of work on questioning the purported objectivity of scientific knowledge. One of his most famous claims, he writes a book on Louis Pasteur. And in it, he claims through what he calls actor network theory, that Pasteur didn't discover microbes. He collaborated with them. Okay? And he sees the non-human microbe as an agent, as an actor, collaborating in the emergence of hygiene and sanitation as a discourse. Okay? Now, scientists often don't like this in some ways, this question of their objectivity and so on. He then comes and he writes this paper where he begins to do something. Because in his previous incarnations in his writing, he has been wedded to this kind of post-structuralist, post-modern, however we want to categorize it, questioning of objectivity of facts. But then he starts to think about a few things. He starts to think about conspiracy theorists, particularly in the context just after 9-11, and about how the political right are questioning climate science. Okay. And so I'll just pick up here. He says, well, what, what's become of critique when this is the way it's used in the everyday world? Okay. And he talks about this Republican strategist who was quoted in the New York Times editorial 
I want to pick up on the second bit. Should the public come to believe that the scientific issues are settled, the Republican strategy says, their views about global warming will change. You know, they'll be more predisposed to environmental actions on. So therefore, on the right, we need to continue to make claims about the lack of scientific certainty. As a primary, make that a primary issue. Now that lack of certainty succeeded in Latin America. Possibly, yeah. Their rhetoric has been very useful. Some of these latources, these are some of our procedures. And then he goes on and he says, what has become a critique when the neighbours in my village look down on me because in 9-11, I believe that terrorists attacked the United States. And they think I'm naive and gullible and unsophisticated. And they say, don't you know it was, there was this other reason behind it? There was this other ideology behind it? So on and so forth. So we can kind of perhaps not be taken in completely by what the tour says. I mean, he himself says, you know, maybe I take conspiracy theories too seriously. I think this is very prescient in a way because he's writing before social media really begins to emerge. Okay? And he says, you know, the thing is, all these explanations, this debunking, okay, whether it's of climate science, whether it's of political motivations, I can see lots of our methods being used within these, these areas and these discourses. And he says, well, you know, we could just dismiss it. We could say, well, this is just a bastardization of what we do. Okay? This is just, they're not doing it properly. Okay? But he doesn't do that. He says, what we need to do is we need to go back and we need to strengthen our own procedures. He used lots of kind of military language. He says, we need to strengthen our own weapons, essentially, to kind of reaffirm what critique, he's talking about critique rather than critical thinking, what it actually is. And as he does so, he says we need to put stop lots of emphasis on debunking ideologies, debunking institutions. We need to begin to protect and care for them. Okay. We need to kind of engage in dialogue and add things to the banks to build things rather than subtract and take away. And I think if we think about our students' conceptions, criticality is just critiquing, just criticising. I think this is very helpful in terms of building, adding, assembling. And what he does is he then goes into a very complex argument that I'm not going to repeat about how my, Martin Heidegger, the German philosopher, uses the term things. Okay. Now, the owl thing, which Heidegger talks about, is the oldest European environment in Iceland. But a thing in kind of Scandinavian languages is an arena a gathering, a place where different participants come together to contest and debate, okay? So he sees it more as an arena, a gathering, a field, okay? And as he does so, he says, we need to be talking about these models of assembly. So I think this is a useful way to try and reconceptualize critical thinking, to think of critical assembly, to have a slightly more positive bend, might have huge implications for public engagement within the universities as well, in terms of how we reach out to wider audiences. Then more recently, Rita Felsky has come out and she's written some pieces. She wrote a book called The Limits of Critique, then she kind of thinks through this in this introduction the value of the humanities. 
And as she does so, she suggests that actually the value lies in four terms. OK. As a musicologist, yeah, as a form of dance background, theatre studies. OK. She says, you know, on one hand, it's about curating. And that could be curating a particular theatre space. It could be a text, a manuscript. Okay. It's about preservation, some sense. She also talks about conveying, about communicating our ideas both to other people and to the wider world. She then comes to criticising, which she does use mostly as objecting, disagreeing, but she also said we need to also have empathy and look at other people's positions and understand why they produce these counter arguments. And then compose it, which is where we remake, we reframe, we revise. And so I've got some quotes here from Velsky. And really what she's trying to do is a few things. On one hand, with curating, she's talking about care and attention for our fields, for our beliefs, okay? of guarding, of protecting. Talks about conveying as our ideas being taken into new arenas. Parliament into new, translated into new environments, and how we need to really engage with that. Okay. She talks about our ideas being translated into the concerns, agendas, and interests of diverse audiences and publics. Then she has criticizing, which I think is close to that student conception, but she says actually, as well, it's also we need to combine disagreement with empathy. And then the final bit is composition, where we're making rather than unmaking, we're adding rather than subtracting, we're translating rather than separating. Now, I think these four terms, curating, conveying, criticising, composing, I think they're a new model, not just for the humanities, but for critical thinking in universities. And I have to be fair here, like Felsky's really talking about the value of the humanities. And you could see what I'm doing as kind of taking that and applying it to every field. But actually, I think this is the value of the humanities and how it has an impact on every other discipline in the university and in social sciences. I think it's really fruitful cross-pollination here. So can you can you stop? And go back to the piece. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I mean, I'm trying to kind of read uh, yeah, as you so, go along. So. I, I quite like that engaging with non-academic audiences because yeah. that was something that came up and I couldn't really verbalize it in my mind. Uh, a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the writing we teach, of course, as academic writing tutors is, is essay. And we ask students obviously to use research to back up their arguments. And a lot of that research, unfortunately, is, you know, uh, Eurocentric, Western, doesn't include any marginalized thinkers, let's say, yeah. and doesn't always necessarily even include women or female thinkers. Yeah. So it's already quite problematic, I think. So, you know, what you are coming up with now and what, what you're bringing us is like a complete, almost like a co complete overthrowing of uh, the models that are being, you know, spoon fed, I'd say, uh, to, to students in universities. Because there is a, a model of thinking and that model is very much Western. It doesn't include different curriculum. So there has to be like a complete changing of the curriculum even. Yeah, are you well? I mean, I would see it more as a tweak, personally. Um, I'd say it does have implications for assessment design. You know, I've actually, I have in the past seen assessments that ask students to come up, compose a new idea. Okay? And actually, I think that's very difficult to do from scratch. I think if you had an assessment that talks about what are the values within a particular field, and then compose a new idea, related to those values that can be applied 
by the you know by the public in a different context? How would you apply it in the Eastern countries instead of the Western? How would you apply it in non-Eurocentric, so on and so forth? Okay. How would you translate it to another field? I hopefully think what's very useful about Persky's model here is that all four things happen or should happen. Okay. So it's not a question of you can just do one. Okay. That in order to rebuild a new model, you're going to have to go back to what the values of your discipline are. Okay. So, you know, in music, it will depend, I guess, upon your, your background in music. And are you, you know, coming from a classical field, from an avant-garde field? What do you believe music should do for audiences? You need to ask those questions before you can write. It's hardly enough space for that, isn't it? That's that's quite a hard thing for a lot of students. Yeah. You know, especially for those who actually come from, you know, non European backgrounds or Asian or sure. you know African. I don't know different different profiles of students. I think it's so much more difficult, especially if there isn't a model, existing model to hold on to. <laughs> Let's try. Let's try and see if it works. There is a new system model. Who's on your own? So I wrote one. Oh, you wrote one? Yes. I wrote one. Okay. And do you not completely like it? It's a first draft. Are you so, sharing it? Yeah, I'm sharing it now. Okay. I got some. And just take one. But I'd, I'd be really interested in what you think works, what doesn't work from this. Um, lots of feedback, to be honest. And I'd love to know, perhaps first of all, does this four-prong model curating, perhaps talking about the value of work, the value of previous work, might the previous current value of this field, might just tweak that. Conveying, communicating and sort of significance, criticizing to problems, refounding for the future. It's a little bit greedy second round for the moment. Because I'm kind of a bit like, I'd like you to use this model. But first of all, I'd like you to know, is it well, I'd like to know, do you think it's any good? Do you think I could sort of change it? Is there anything I need to do differently? Adam, can I ask you, have you used this at any particular levels? Finish writing it at 1.30 in the morning last night. Yeah. <laughs> which, which, which level did you bring this in? I mean, well, in terms of practical... It's a, very, it's a very good question. I wonder, and I wonder whether I might need to write some sort of how to use it with this, because I wonder whether curating is more something that happens in your first term as a general thing. You know, like the importance of particular legal practices, the importance of particular legal values, the importance of legal ethics, and so on and so forth. Now, you're going to keep on using that. And it might be that in the first term, you wouldn't want to take them all the way to composing new ideas. Yeah, but I, I think, think you yeah. can build to it as they go. I through think that this growth. Having read this earlier, I mean, it's excellent. Um, I'm just thinking of with level three, level four students. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned earlier, they're, they're coming from an attitude of I shouldn't even be criticized. I'm just a student. Mm -hmm. And then something like this in terms of cognitive load <laughs> on a student. So I'm just wondering what your experience is or what you might think I'm presenting. Obviously, you wouldn't present it in this form, I'm assuming, to, to level four students. No, I, mean, I, you I, I, I think you would probably give one piece mm -hmm. at a time. Um, I, I think it's too text heavy, but then if I'm going to produce some, I mean, I, should I put it on two pages? And I'm not even the text. Ones. As I said, just, mean, just the, the concepts of the world. Yeah. I mean, um, I was just thinking about the students that I do without making any video school. I, I guess, obviously, one thing a student might say is, do I have to ask every single exactly. question? Mm. You know, and I think you'd have to be very clear to say these are just prompts. Mm. OK, yeah. so, you know, if I'm talking about an, an author's approach, I might particularly 
talk about how their approach reaffirms a particular value, a particular, let's say, traditional value within that field. I guess it would depend on are they really radical? If I think their approach is not as strong as it could be, maybe I go somewhere else. Okay? So I think they're more points of departure, yeah. they're more stimuluses, prompts. I'm not really sure as a resource how I get around that and keep it on one page, apart from saying, as educators, I would just introduce one at a time. Um, would you possibly introduce like curating level for conveying five, six, and seven? Yes. Yeah, it does kind of feel like that. It does feel like that. But then I guess I guess there become questions around differentiation. There might be some of our students who, you know, get to some stages later. I think certainly as a say for I mean, I think something that would work really well with this is an assessment design that talks roughly around values at level four, around communicating to publics, to audiences, whoever they might be at level five, and then at level six as um, rethinking models. Yeah, broadly speaking, I don't know what anyone thinks. <laughs> I need to catch a shot in, so sure. I'll, like just drop this here. Um, I think it's great, wonderful, and I will use that. But what if this could be stretched to what I just tried to say before yeah, about humanizing and personalizing and placing the student at the center of this before they look at blah 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 text. Okay. Where does the student stand? Because at the end of the day. We are, I mean, if we're going to create critical thinkers that are going to be useful in the society, yeah. we just want them to really start from what matters to them, what, what they want, what they are worried about. So would it, do you think it would be useful if it was two pages? One which was like the <laughs> author's approach? Sign where they like, just, just think about themselves, their identities, okay. where they come okay. from, what matters to them. Like, okay. Maybe there are in more important things that, that they want to write about than yeah. worrying about this important theory that's been dropped onto them. You see what I mean? Like yeah. I think I think personalizing is is gonna take away that edge of that worry about, oh my god, there's another theory I have to criticize and I have to understand, you know, where am I like in this? When we personalize that, isn't all these the four categories we possibly use like we talk about our, what we think our values like what what is a good lawyer what is a good musicologist what is it I, I love what you're saying yeah the approach that i take oh, yeah, which is sure. experimental <laughs> yeah needless to say was a dialogic approach so i was bringing it more to life so rather than saying okay this is it i was drawing it out for students or well, they were not i was not even drawing it out yeah. they were coming to life and explaining certain things to me mm -hmm. and then i was compartmentalizing it in my mind to say right okay so they they are they're the curators right they are you know student centric so they're the ones who are curating the information and then we were building on it and it actually worked for them and this was at level five it's level five last, okay. uh, last semester. So could this be used almost as an afterthought? Not, not so much as an afterthought, but as in you do the dialogic process yes. first, and then you kind of reveal this is what has been, this is how I think of us, and this could be used as you approach this, because this is what you were doing in our gathering, in our arena, in our assembly. You see what I mean? So yeah. maybe it's about the timing of when to go. Because I think I think I can sense here, and I think you're probably all right. If if you give this to students in the first term, yeah. No way. Yeah. If we give bits of it at different points, I think it might be useful. I wonder then whether. I slightly wonder whether I need two resources, one for staff, one for students. Like so many. Yeah, one really phrase it purely in the personal, yeah. your values, your your yeah. heads. And another from an educational development point of view, how do you get 
students to talk about. And maybe that that's really helpful. Actually. I'm not sure how to do it. <laughs> yeah. So I'll do it. I'm just going to touch over these, maybe the video at home. I mean, I'd like to talk about curating in terms of the text relationship to previous work and to values of a discipline. And I guess that could be reframed from students' perspective about how they link it to previous work, but how, what they think the text relationship is to previous work, what they think um, the text says about the values of a discipline. I mean, Adam, I can see this working really well in particular contexts. For example, like a lit review, right? So, yeah. in the literature review, in let's say at level six, six project, yeah, okay. How to approach the literature review? Maybe this work really well. Yeah. It's more useful for dissertation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. I think that I'm sure we use this. We use this in social sciences at level seven because yeah, yeah. Okay. I think I agree with them. I taught a lot of science. I can't see you getting to the second or the third, third or the fourth column until you get to the end of and, the table. And this dissertation. Okay. Maybe it's a dissertation or something. I think it's very humanity thinking that your first day, you're you're trying to, first, you, first semester, you're trying to get them to think. Whereas in a, in a different discipline, it's about principles and, and and threshold concepts that once you get those ideas then yeah. you can start thinking do you don't get the freedom to do that till you get to do your dissertation yeah. but then at level four if you talk about scientific principles scientific yeah, methods that's it's still cu curation yeah. and it is curation it's just that yeah. the next yeah. yeah okay okay so i think there is a sense then there's these map onto different levels. And then if we just gave it to level four students in the first half, it's too much. But we could certainly give them that level four. Yeah, if you, okay. if you, if you would tweak it about the science of report, this is what you need in each of your of your sections for your lab report. Yeah. Right up three of those for your first yeah. Um, assessment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Adam, can I just say one thing following on from what Pam and Pina said? This thing about curation and the individual, there's also a sort of coming from social science, but there's all there's also something about power here yeah. going on. And it is a bit of a problem because if you come in with this is the canon or this is the thing, and, and you and you come in or you know nothing about critical, or you know, you know, people are coming, especially mature students from the world, and they do they have got criticality in their lives that I understand there's a difference between academic criticality in a certain sense, but maybe you need to make that explicit about the skills that they already have. And also there's the thing about the curation, you know, Pinal said, who chooses the curation? Yeah. That, it's very uh, much imposed. What's economical? Yeah. So, but then even if we are going to critique a canon of sorts as Eurocentric, as ableist, as, you know, um, you know, whatever kinds of problems there might be with it, we need to know about the values that are currently claimed for the canon before we can tell them and say, actually, this doesn't work, this doesn't fit. I think being honest, feedback about the personal aspect we use for, I mean, I do think one of the things I probably need to do from this is devise a student version, a staff version. I mean, I do think that. Feedback seems very helpful. Also, I think this idea of value, I think value is very difficult to sort of find. Maybe perhaps thinking it in terms of assumptions, the assumptions that people have rather okay. than values. I mean, and then values is difficult to pick out. Yeah. I mean, if we're talking about Eurocentric and stuff like that, if it's, I don't think it's like a, a value that's been thought out. It might no. just be an assumption that they have because I'm coming from this particular viewpoint. That's just the assumption I hold. And, and I get somebody else holding. The question I need to consider is do those assumptions fall in the conveying part? Mm -hmm. Because you're communicating things without considering 
the assumptions that lie behind yeah. what you're communicating yeah. give a different perspective, a different experience as well. Let's move on to the video. Um, so obviously, if the video at home, some questions for criticising it. I think some of this could be used earlier as we begin to think about getting them to become more critical. Questions at this And just finally, um, I think we are kind of, this is where we want to take our students, right? This is where we want them to get to by level six. We want them to reframe, rethink ideas, apply them in the everyday world, translate them to new contexts. Because more than that, Watson Glazer test of critical thinking. If you can do that in an interview, if you can apply it to the context you're going to go and work in, for example, that might be more helpful. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Lots of food for thought. Um, feel free to use it as it stands. I mean, it sounds like or email me and we'll discuss tweets. Um, it might be that next September is when it begins to get used. Um, yeah. And then as a reference, just at the end of the slides, if the register's gone round, if you touch your name, I'll make sure the slides get emailed to you as well. Brilliant. Thanks. 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 Thanks.